isn't that jacket just to die for? <laughs> edit that out, edit that out. I didn't sign a release. I refuse. This is footage I shot in 2011. I'm younger, with more hair. And I'm wearing the worst sunglasses you can imagine. Bright red Ray-Bans. I'm hamming it up with producer Mark Smirling during the making of part one of the Jinx. Okay, so we're, this is, we're going back to Sareb's house. It's 3.20. I'm mispronouncing Sareb Kaufman's name. He's Susan Berman's adopted stepson, and he's found something we have to see. He earlier called Mark, found a letter that supposedly is from Bob, and he's flipping out about it. So we're going to go calm him down. Clearly, I don't think this letter is going to be very interesting, and I've never been more wrong about anything ever. This letter is the piece of evidence that changes everything. Hi, I'm Zach Stewart Pontier, one of the filmmakers behind HBO's The Jinx, and welcome back to the official Jinx podcast. A show where we take you behind the scenes of Andrew Jarecki's documentary series that became a real-life murder investigation. As we get ready to release part two of The Jinx on Max, April 21st, today on the show, we're looking back at chapter five. Family values. But before we get back to that letter, we're going to start in the early 1980s, just before Kathy Durst disappeared. There was a time when me and my cousins were playing and uh, a bee's nest fell on our heads. This is Robert Durst's nephew, Evan Krieger. He's telling filmmaker Andrew Jarecki about growing up with his Aunt Kathy. And Kathy, who was there, was first on the scene. And she helped us, you know, with whatever ointments and stuff. And that's, that's always going to be a beautiful memory for me. When she disappeared, I was very upset, not just because it was like, what the heck is going on? But then it was like, oh, and by the way, your uncle Robert Durst might have something to do with her disappearance. Bob told the police that on January 31st, 1982, he had driven Kathy to the train station in Westchester, that she had boarded the 917 train and made it back to their Manhattan apartment. The fact that she arrived in Manhattan alive that day, and then they got the doorman and all these people saying uh, that they, they, they seen her and some guy goes up to, in the elevator. This is former NYPD detective Michael Strzok. He led the original Kathy Durst missing persons case, and he says for a while, Robert Durst was cooperating with the investigation. 10, 11 weeks after the case began, I received a call and uh, a male voice in the other end, uh, Hi, Mike. And I said, oh, who's this? This is Nick. And I said, uh, Nick who? And he says, Nick Scapetta. Nick Scapetta was a very prominent defense attorney in New York City, hired to represent Robert Durst. Nick Scapetta was your lawyer to defend you from the potential of accusations. He was my lawyer, but he was supposed to find Kathy Durst. I mean, if he could find Kathy Durst, there'd be no accusations. Bob and Andrew talked about why Scapetta was hired. Was it to find Kathy Durst or to protect Bob? Was he supposed to find Kathy? Yes. He brought in a private investigator who used to be a cop in, in that, or used to be a big cop in that precinct. Um, what was it? Ed Wright. Ed Wright was a former police officer, so he had connections to the NYPD. Ed Wright was able to get lots of stuff. He was able to get information that was theoretically unavailable. Who thought what? Who said what? Ed Wright does his due diligence in just three days. He speaks to Bob, along with the other key witnesses, and he puts all his findings into a report. He calls it discrepancies in the recollections of various principles. Most of these discrepancies have to do with Bob's story. And so, Bob says, his family didn't like Ed Wright. 
my family will call them Ed Wrong, may and may not have believed most of my story or not that much of my story, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were never exactly 100% sure which side he was on. Here's Detective Mike Strzok again, reading from that report. This particular report indicates how Bob Durst had changed his story to his own investigator about where he'd called Kathy on the night of January 31st. Ed Wright identifies very quickly that Bob is lying. In the first interview with Wright, Mr. Durst stated that he called from his own house. On the second interview, he told Mr. Wright that he'd made a call to his wife from a payphone in a restaurant. He later on stated that he had called Kathy from a payphone between the house and the train station. And Ed figured out that Kathy hadn't actually made it back to the city. He interviews the building staff. He finds the actual elevator operator working that night, who says, quote, Kathleen Durst never came into the building. After Scopetta got the reports identifying that Bob's story has holes in it, he calls Detective Mike Strzok. All communication with his client should go through Scopetta. Bob Durst, uh, you know, really appreciates the work that you're doing and, uh, you know, is very satisfied. But, you know, Bob is a very busy guy. And that uh, I would appreciate that all, all of the communication going forward you do through me. That's the classic lawyering up. During the making of part one, producer Mark Smerling tracked down Ed Wright. Hello. I'm looking for Edward Wright, who was a private detective back in the, in the 1980s. <clears throat> no, I was chief investigator in New York State Organized Crime Task Force. Uh, something tells me you're my man. Mark asks Ed about his time working on the Durst case and why it ended. There came a time when uh, I was mutually terminated. We decided it was best for them to go another way. But that's about, you know, at this juncture, I'd be uncomfortable discussing anything else about it. Um, but from reading the report, I can understand why that is. I mean, okay. it, yeah. So Ed Wright says he wrote these reports and then he got fired. Here's Andrew and Bob again. Were there five meetings with Ed Wright? Were there 10 meetings with Ed Wright? Me, I must have had 10 or a dozen meetings, including the ones in our office where, where Douglas was usually there and the ones in, in Nick's office. So Doug was probably in on how many of them? Five, six, like that. If Douglas Durst, Bob's younger brother and chairman of the Durst organization, was in these meetings, then it would strongly suggest that he knew Bob had murdered Kathy. But Douglas has said he was not in these meetings. He wrote to Andrew after this episode aired, saying, quote, I never attended any meetings with Robert Durst and Nicholas Capetta regarding Kathleen Durst's disappearance or any other matter. This is another example of Robert's lies and distortions, end quote. Bob and Douglas's relationship goes back a long time, and it's a very complicated one. Here's their nephew, Evan Krieger, again. We're talking about a sibling rivalry that's quite advanced in terms of who's going to run a billion dollar business. And the eldest doesn't win that, and it goes to, you know, the, the second eldest. In theory, after the patriarch Seymour Durst stepped down, control of the vast wealth and power of the Durst real estate empire should have gone to the eldest son, Bob. But it didn't. Instead, it went to Douglas. Here's Bob talking about this in a moment that didn't make it into the jinx. You talked about the idea that you were uh, hoping that you were going to be chosen to take over and then you were going to uh, quit it down, quit. But that's not how things work out or not thing, how things worked out. Tell me about, was that accurate or is that, a, I'm trying to... Yes, 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 yes. I, I wasn't pl planning on convincing them to make me president and then quit. That would have been ridiculous. I mean, you had to act like you were, you were 
presidential material, and then you had to act like president, and I never did any of that. Was there actually a formal announcement that Douglas was going to be the new? Yes, leader? yes. Tell yeah, me about it was that. Douglas's announcement. Seymour never made an announcement. Douglas made an announcement that he was taking over the Durst organization. There was no reason for there to be a formal announcement. By all accounts, in 1994, when Douglas was picked to take over the family business, Bob left the Durst organization and never returned. He cut off contact with all his friends at the time. Some of these guys are going to meet in part two. And Bob moved to Northern California. An extreme hatred for his younger brother is cemented. You know, it jumps off the page that Bob just despises Douglas. This is former Westchester investigator Ed Murphy talking to Andrew about evidence that shows just how much Bob hated Douglas. Some of the writings that were recovered in Pennsylvania in his notebook, where he puts uh, Douglas Durst puts me in the same place where uh, Kathy put me. But he's telling himself that Douglas is in the same place as far as he's concerned that uh, Kathy was in, you know, we all believe he killed Kathy, so there's no doubt he, he would try and kill Doug if he could, I think. There's a lot of speculation about whether Bob was actually trying to kill Douglas. But here's Bob in a prison phone call with his second wife, Debbie, seemingly admitting to what he was trying to do. Did I tell you that I went to his Kona house and I was driving around these places? I grew up, my family places. And oh, it was in the newspaper then. Yeah, yeah, but but, but I, I really went. My Don't plan, say it. Yeah. Okay. Definitely not going to say okay. it. Okay. In 2001, after the murder and dismemberment of Morris Black, when Bob was on the run, he drove by Douglas's house in Westchester. According to the New York Times, Bob was outside Douglas's house, armed with two guns. If he did try to kill his brother, he didn't succeed. You know, I certainly screwed it up, didn't I? Douglas knew full well that his brother was trying to kill him. Here he is in a deposition being asked about it. The press reported that you had hired a bodyguard to protect yourself against Robert Durst. Is that true? That is true, yes. Bob was also deposed and also asked about it. Do you know why Douglas Durst hired a bodyguard? Because he's a pussy. When asked publicly, Douglas refrains from saying too much about his brother Bob. Unfortunately, there is no haven from what's, uh, what's going on with my brother. Is it, there is no way to describe what uh, my family and I go through because of this. But uh, it's not something that we discuss and not something that we have any involvement in. Douglas says he doesn't have any involvement, but there is evidence that he may have worked behind the scenes to shield his family from Bob's misdeeds. There's a story that isn't in the show, but it's in Andrew's film about Bob, All Good Things. Here's Andrew in a never-before-heard interview. So when we were making the feature, All Good Things, and we were researching it, and we wanted to make sure we got it right, we thought this meeting between the district attorney and the brother of the person who was being accused of murder was an interesting meeting. In 2005, Former Westchester County District Attorney Janine Pirro met with Douglas Durst. At the time, she was reinvestigating Kathy's disappearance. I was told about this meeting from two people, one of them being Janine. This is Kevin Hines. He worked in the Westchester County DA's office with Pirro, and he tells Andrew that Pirro and Douglas met at Cafe Madeline, a restaurant in the theater district in a building owned by the Dursts, and that the whole place was shut down just for them wasn't that she had, um, there was any, anything nefarious about that meeting, other than he had asked that his children not be involved in any grand jury presentation. And uh, some of the members of our team had decided to focus on the possibility of subpoenaing um, those, uh, those people to the grand jury, the, the, the children of Douglas, because there was some evidence that they may have known something. Piero tells Andrew what she was hoping to find out at the meeting from Douglas. Douglas reached out to you at some point, said, I want to meet, and you guys ended up meeting. Yes. What do you remember about that? Uh, I wanted to know from Douglas whether he had any information 
on the disappearance of Kathleen. That was always the motivation for me, solving this case. And whether or not there was anything that I should know that, you know, he wouldn't want other people to know, I, I needed to know anything. And shame on me if I didn't try to get whatever information I could. Former ADA Kevin Hines says that after the meeting, everything changed. All I can tell you is the facts, which are that she did tell me about a meeting with Douglas Durst. And from that point on, every time I or members of my team asked for the permission to go to the grand jury, she would say, we don't have enough. Get me more. In the All Good Things DVD commentary, Andrew asked Bob about this meeting between Pirro and Douglas. Did you ever hear about this meeting? When uh... Only through the media, so I have no idea if it happened or not, but the media also says that after the meeting, Janine Pirro backed off. But Andrew wanted to hear from Douglas. What would he say about this meeting with Janine Pirro? Or about his brother or his sister-in-law, who's been missing for almost three decades? First, Andrew tries to get Douglas on the phone, but his public affairs team doesn't make it easy. It is. Hi, it's Jordan Bow. It's you called Douglas Durst. I'm returning his call. I did call Douglas Durst. How can I help you? Uh, you called him. Precisely. Yes. I'm returning that call on his behalf. Can I help you with something? Yeah, I wanted to talk to him about the film that I'm making. Okay, Douglas has no interest in speaking with you. Is there something you want me to relate to him? Douglas is a character in the film. He's certainly an element of it, and uh, I want to make sure that he has a chance to talk to me about it before we complete the film. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. The phone is a dead end. It's time for Plan B. We're going to see Bob Durst's brother, Douglas. See what we can learn face to face by getting to know the man a bit. Andrew and I are on our way to the Plaza Hotel to confront Douglas Durst. Have you ever met him before? I've never met him before. I've seen him around a few social occasions. But uh, we're going to go to a dinner in his honor. Tickets to this event are $1,000 each. And once you're in the door, there's security everywhere which terrifies me because I'm trying to casually film the whole thing, and I can tell anyone who sees me knows I'm snooping around. Andrew and I mill about for a few minutes, and then he makes his move. Can I interrupt you? First, I want to congratulate you. Thank you. Then I want to tell you I'm Andrew Jurecki. Oh, you are? I mean you no harm. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, at some point, us getting a chance to successful. talk. Well, I try, I, it's not my goal. You know, I'd be happy to come sit down and talk at some point if you're, you know, so motivated. Just as Andrew walks away, Douglas whispers something to someone I think is his security, and I pray they don't notice me. Listening back, I sound very freaked out. So when we got up, the security guard went into the other room and like radioed? Uh, I don't know. Turns out that security person, it was actually Douglas's fixer, Jordan Barowitz, that PR guy who brushed Andrew off on the phone earlier. After the gala, we make it back out onto the street, and I start rolling. They have all the Durst family members there, and, you know, they've eliminated Bob. Certainly they would have a good argument to say, well, Bob hasn't been that uh, beneficial for our family in recent years. But, you know, it's as if Doug has become the eldest son of the Durst family. Andrew never heard back from Douglas, and that stuck with him. He talked about it in that unreleased HBO interview. This was not a distant relative. This was Douglas Durst's sister-in-law, Douglas and his wife. They lived in the same house for a long period of time with Bob and Kathy. Not only did the Durst family not reach out to the McCormick family to help them when they had obviously lost their, their daughter, their sister, the person that they had loved, but they uh, kind of closed ranks and didn't speak to the family, hired lawyers. It's heartbreaking, really. The Durst's have all the power and privilege in the world, 
and they obviously know more about what happened to Kathy, but they still choose to pretend nothing's going on. I'm not happy about the fact that it's 30 years later and there's a Berlin Wall of silence. Kathy's family, the McCormicks, tried multiple times to visit the Durst and ask for help. Here's Kathy's brother, Jim. Our family was in New York City and we got ourselves basically invited over. We kept pressing him, saying, Seymour, what, what can you tell us? How can you help? And it was like, well, I don't know anything. It was like there was no warmth or empathy from a guy whose daughter-in-law is missing under the strangest and most bizarre of circumstances. After they were let in and the pleasantries were over, one of the Durst brothers told them it was time to go. Maybe something will come of this, huh? Wouldn't it be nice? At the time of this interview, Ann McCormick, Kathy's mom, was 99 years old. Though her daughter had been missing for over three decades, she never gave up hope. You never know, you read this, and years later, they found out this, they found out that. And there might be somebody out there that knows something and is keeping quiet, so. <laughs> And we're back to where we started at the top of the show. Going to see Susan Berman's adopted son, Sarah Kaufman, to see about a letter that he found. So let me see the letter. Well, actually, I'd like to show you something else first. OK. And I mean, of course, I told you this, but. Oh, yeah. Look at the handwriting. Uh... Night, what do you see? It's an envelope on Robert Durr's stationery, addressed to Susan the year before she was killed. Spelled out in block letters is her address, 1527 Benedict Canyon Drive, Beverly Hills, California. The thing is, Beverly is spelled wrong with an extra E, almost exactly like the cadaver note, that anonymous note notifying the police where Susan Berman's body was after she was killed. The two Beverlys are nearly identical. I you know, I'm, I, it was clear enough that I might be dancing with the devil. In the final episode of part one, Andrew sits down for a second interview with Bob. Andrew, um, I am ready to be filmed if you're still interested in doing that. I am, of course. This interview and what happened after the camera stopped rolling, that's next time on the official Jinx podcast. The official Jinx podcast is hosted by me, Zach Stewart Pontier. It's produced by ZSP Media and Hit the Ground Running Films with HBO. Watch episodes of The Jinx and stream The Jinx Part 2 starting April 21st on Max. This episode was produced by Ramoy Phillip. The rest of our team is Ethan Oberman, Naomi Bronner, and Laura Newcomb. The supervising producer is Liz Stiles. This episode was edited by Simone Polanin. Mixing and engineering by Zach Schmidt. It was recorded by Brett Tubin at Relic Room in New York City. Music by Wes Dylan Thordson. Additional music courtesy of HBO. The executive producers are Andrew Jarecki and me, Zach Stewart-Pontier. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Ali Cohen, Aaron Kelly, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And the fabulous Jinx team, Sam Neve, Kyle Martin, Charlotte Kaufman, Richard Hankin, Susan Lazarus, Annabelle White, Pedro Vital, Jesse Herman, Michele Zabarfian, and Nako Narder. And thanks to Roe Dillon, George Vogel, Charlie Wessler, Nancy Jarecki, and Emily Wiedemann. And thank you for listening and making it all the way through the credits. Here's another clip of Andrew after the event with Douglas. Bob said, uh, said, oh, well, that's great that you're going to the event tonight. I said, well, you know, it's for the children. And he says, yes, I love the children. <laughs> I said, well, that's good. I mean, do you love the children enough that you would pick up the tab for our tickets tonight? And he said, I don't love the children that much. <laughs>